2022 is a pretty big year for me in terms of films being released. From big franchises like Sonic the Hedgehog 2 that reminded me of the nostalgia of my childhood, to everything everywhere all at once that made me laugh and cry and view the world differently after I left the theater, movies have just been pretty good this year. Or, uh, at least the ones I've seen so far. Just like the other two mentioned, Netflix's new release, The Sea Beast, is one of those films. I watched it with one of my friends over a Discord call through entirely legal means, I don't know what you're talking about, and it was a really, really good film, and there was a lot to say about it. The animation- ow, my hand. The animation is amazing. The animators paid so much detail to everything, every minute detail, from the way the water is rendered in the film to even one of the main character's hair being animated properly when it's wet versus when it's dry. The details of the animation alone are astounding, and that isn't even including how beautiful the cinematography is on many of the shots of the film. A discussion of the animation alone could be its own video, and maybe I'll make that one day, but not now. Stars! Can't do it! Not today! What I want to focus on in this video is the story of the Sea Beast and an exploration of one of the many themes in it. Because yes, while a lot of reviewers on Letterboxd are trying to be quippy and call it How to Train Your Dragon of the Caribbean, it's much more than that. There are similarities, sure. The story revolves around a young child learning that the monsters they were raised to fear aren't really that bad, but the way the plot is structured takes it in different ways and ex explores different questions throughout the film. Also, if you haven't seen it yet, please go watch it before watching this video. It's on Netflix, but I mean, it's a pirate movie, if you know what I mean. Spoilers be ahead, mateys. That was the cringiest thing I've ever seen. Your parents died heroes. I don't want to believe that, but maybe you can be a hero and still be wrong. Just like I said before, there are a lot of basic, surface-level comparisons people can make between the Sea Beast and the first How to Train Your Dragon film. The monsters in each story are not as vile and evil as the story is painting them to be. In fact, they're quite intelligent and satient, satient, sentient, and only attack the humans back because the humans attack them, which creates this cycle of violence. But that's where the similarities truly end. And don't get me wrong, there isn't anything wrong with comparing works of art to each other. One of my previous videos was literally a comparative analysis of how we retell the same core story of Cinderella, so I can't make fun of people for comparing things. I'd be a hypocrite. What I am trying to point out for, I guess, a bit more of a comedic effect than anything is that comparing the sea beast and how to train your dragon is like comparing apples and oranges, even if they share the same basic premise. So let's talk a bit about the story. There was a time when children dreaded the night. The story surrounds two different but similar characters. The first is a sea beast hunter, Jacob Holland, who was rescued by hunters as a child and raised by them to the extent where he's able to kill multiple sea beasts in a small window of time. Is it true you done that? Four in two days? Don't believe everything you hear, Les. Four in two days? Hm. It was five. The second main character is a young orphan girl named Maisie Brumble, whose parents were both hunters but were both killed when she was young. She is taken in by an orphanage run by the kingdom's royalty and is a bit of a rambunctious scamp who is determined to make it as a hunter herself. She has spent her whole life reading all the books she can about hunters, especially about the crew The Inevitable, of which Jacob is a part of. Maisie eventually stows away on The Inevitable to try and make her dreams of being a hunter come true. I stowed away. <sighs> And despite Jacob's many protests, the captain of the inevitable, Captain Crow, the same man who took him in, takes a shining to Maisie and lets her stay. No, I like this kid. She's all vinegar. The inevitable is on the hunt for a large red sea beast known as the Bluster, who has taken out many of their ships. This is the hunter's last chance to prove to the king and queen of the kingdom that hunters are more worth it than their flashy navy, which threatens to replace the hunter's livelihoods. ...of a new era. The crown will no longer support the hunters. After encountering the Bluster, Maisie ends up taking a big risk against Captain Crow's orders as people are literally about to die in a whirlpool and frees the Bluster. In the chaos of it all, she and Jacob are both thrown overboard and eventually swallowed whole by the beast. It turns out the Bluster isn't going to eat them and instead discards Maisie and Jacob on an island in the middle of the Dreadmoor, the part of the ocean most of the sea beasts live on. And this is where everything begins to change. 
First of all, the sea beasts can walk on land. And second of all, everything changes in Maisie's eyes. You know, her whole life. She's read books about how the sea beasts would come to shore and pluck gardeners from their yards and kill and pillage towns, but maybe everything she's ever known is wrong. Mr. Jacob Holland, who has been taking a lot of L's lately. Jacob, look out! <laughs> Oh, bloody hell. Denies that this is the case, but at the very least he tries to take care of and defend Maisie from anything that might harm them. Maisie adopts a little blue sea monster she names Blue, who, by the way, I would definitely buy a plushie of, and they eventually make it off the island, but not on their little dinghy. Instead, Maisie convinces the bluster who she nicknames Red, to help ferry them across the ocean to the nearest island where Jacob could tail a ship and get Maisie back to the orphanage where she's from. They go through this really fun montage where they both learn that maybe sea beasts aren't as evil as they were told, maybe their history books aren't as accurate as they seem, and Jacob ends up renouncing the way of a hunter. No more monster hunting! Or, well, he tries to. The ships from the Royal Navy are spotted on the other side of the island, and Red goes after them. In the process of trying to stop her, Maisie's injured, and eventually, the inevitable comes sailing by, led by Captain Crow, who has made a deal with an elderly merchant slash probably a witch lady named Gwen Batterby, who supplied him with enough poison to kill Red and a harpoon to shoot Red with. Maisie is nursed back to health just in time for them to arrive at the capital of the kingdom. While trapped in her room, Maisie recognizes that the book she's been carrying throughout her journey throughout her whole adventure, which apparently is a very waterproof book, has the same sigil as every other book about hunters, which is the sigil of the royal family. And this is where the realization hits. Everything that the people of this kingdom has learned has been fed by the royal family. It has been, without a doubt, propaganda against the sea beasts. And this is the moment that made me realize I want to make a video about this. And and we don't say yar half this much. I every other page was shown yar. I mean, this is just nonsense. Says you, but the book says otherwise, and it's going to outlast both of us. Propaganda gets used a lot as one of those buzzwords that woke SJWs use to decry any sort of media that is different from what they agree with. It is used by conservatives who like to use the term cancel culture a lot, especially when it comes to media including diverse experience, be it queer, POC, or different religious or disabled experiences. But this film tackles, amongst its many other themes, the effects that propaganda can have on its people. Because, let's be fair, we experience a lot of propaganda every day, and I'm not just saying politically. Marketing and advertising is built on propaganda. Depending on whether or not I get a copyright claim on this video, you're probably going to see an ad or two before it or somewhere else on the website, if you don't use an ad blocker to get rid of them, you coward. Propaganda is mostly a word used to describe different ways that people try and persuade others either to buy their products or to not buy others' products or whether or not to support political candidates in electoral campaigns. So in its ad campaigns, Mars set about making its M&M characters Let's think about toothpaste. For almost every toothpaste brand, 9 out of 10 dentists agree that their toothpaste brand is the best. But it also kind of gets drowned out by the fact that every, t every toothpaste brand says that 9 out of 10 dentists agree that their toothpaste is the best. So every toothpaste is the best because 9 out of 10 dentists agree? But then what happened to the last dentist? Why do not 10 dentists agree? Obviously that kind of statement might not be true, but you might be convinced to buy a certain brand of toothpaste because of these testimonials of dentists saying that this is the best toothpaste brand. The Sea Beast does talk about the other kind of propaganda though, the type that uses fear as a basis to drive people. 
it defines two things, an us versus a them. Building fear-based propaganda over a conflict is one of the best ways to control people further. We, we're seeing it today in the way that even the Republican Party is turning against itself with the rhinos, Republicans in name only, being the them, and the us being the rational Republicans who uh, want to make America great again or whatever. This othering effect between the us and them is pretty clear in the books in the film. All of the books about the sea beasts are about how evil they are, about how they pluck people from their backyards and eat them in front of their families, about how many people they have killed. It creates the sea beasts as the enemy they have to fight, even though they aren't intrinsically a violent species. And the sea beasts as well, despite them being not human, have developed this us versus them mentality as well, because the humans attack them, so they attack back. And then they attack the humans again, and it just creates and feeds this cycle of violence that is very hard to break out of. And you can see in the big crisis in the film that Red is going to go after the sea beast hunters, but is stopped and Maisie points out how it will just feed into the cycle of violence. Our books, our history is a lie. I don't believe the beast ever threatened our shores. It was just a story. A story told by them! People's fears are very easy to manipulate. So instead of maybe thinking they should move more inland to try and get away from the sea beasts, which wouldn't really work because it seems like most sea beasts are an amphibious creature and can go on land as well as water, the royal family in the sea beast uses fear to manipulate their kingdom's people into believing that the sea beasts are monsters. But they aren't monsters. Sure, they're big things that live in the ocean and clearly have some inspiration from nightmare-esque material, but the sea beasts aren't as openly hostile and violent as they're portrayed to be. And the royal family, built upon this lie, creates the green cushion that they sit on. As Maisie says at the end of the movie, For generations, They've taught us to hate the beasts and sent the hunters out to destroy them. And the beasts learned to fear us and hate us. And they fought back. Who are you to malign your king and queen with such falsehoods? You have no right to speak. I have every right. I come from a long line of hunters that died your great death. It's rare for films to make such statements against groups of power. Robots in 2005, which can be seen as a critique of capitalism and how easily people can be replaced and forgotten when they're not built the same as the ruling class, ends up being lackluster in its ending, where the heroes side with a capitalist. And then a dance montage, because apparently every early 2000s animated films had to have one of those. But the sea beast is not afraid to hold back. For one, there's actually a bit of sailor's mouth in a lot of the film, but in broader strokes, the sea beast directly attacks imperialism and propaganda through the voice of a little black girl, and it's powerful. Like, you have to see the movie to truly understand what it's like. It wasn't what I was expecting at all, especially from a kid's movie. Maisie's speech at the end of the film is a direct reflection of her realizations about how the royal family has lied to its people and has cushioned themselves away from everyone else, on top of all the blood that has been spilled from both sides. The movie ends shortly after Maisie's big speech, and she and Jacob go to live out the rest of their days with Blue in a little cottage by the river. I think this ending is a perfect ending for Maisie's character. She is allowed to be a kid. Jacob is allowed to live peacefully and Maisie is allowed to be a kid and it's probably one of the best endings I could ask for in this film. And I promise I'll never hunt sea monsters again. No more monster hunting! <laughs> uh. 
The Sea Beast is a really great film. I didn't get to talk about the other themes in the film or how the characters are diverse and allowed to be diverse with no question, or even the way that the film directly highlights is the differences between the common people and the ruling class just through accents alone. Please, if you haven't seen it already and have sat through this whole video, go watch The Sea Beast wherever you can find it. I know it's probably going to be snubbed from award season this year, but it really deserves a lot more praise and attention than it is getting. I had a pirate phase in middle school. Maybe I should revert back to my pirate phase. Having said all that, I hope y'all enjoyed the video. Like, share, subscribe, whatever, and take care of yourself wherever you are and live a great life.